Hello again, and welcome back to another day of daily Bible study. We're continuing on to the Gospel according to Luke. We're in chapter 16, and we're going to pick up today in starting in verse 14. Before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, in, in little passages where there's a lot going on, but also some strangeness, Lord, help us to, to see the depth of what you're up to. Lord, help us to not uh, get so confused by that which is confusing that we forget to pay attention to what is plain. Lord, uh, help us to tie together these teachings of these last few sessions. And Lord, uh, we ask that you be glorified in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a fascinating passage, and I, I wanna, I'll read it first, and then I'll make a few comments about the, the structure of it, and then we'll talk about what's in it. Starting in verse 14, we read, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. So, I don't know about you, but that strikes me as a very strange sequence of verses. First of all, uh, just, just to know, point out that, that at the beginning of this chapter, we said he was also saying to his disciples. So Jesus was having this conversation with his disciples, and all of a sudden we realize he hasn't taken them off by themselves to explain all these things. He's still doing it in a semi-public place because Pharisees are able to be there and overhear what he's saying. So then he responds directly to the Pharisees, and we're going to come back to that as far as the content of this passage. But then you have, you have three verses in here that seem to be completely unconnected with anything that came before it. But the law and prophets have been proclaimed until John, and people are forcing their way into it. Then we have, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter to fall. And then everyone who divorces his wife, you know, a comment about divorce. Okay, so the thing is, each one of those three passages has a parallel in the Gospel of Matthew, and I believe it does not have a parallel in the Gospel of Mark. So... There is, anybody who's read through the Gospels uh, will, can tell you and will notice that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in some very significant ways, and the Gospel of John is very different. In fact, the three are so similar that we say we could, you could almost like see them together. And so they, they, they have the name the Synoptic Gospels, the ones you see at the same time or see together. And so there's been, always been a question about if they're so similar, uh, what is this relationship? And so there's questions about, you know, which gospel was written first? Did other gospel writers have access to it? The general consensus, which, which, you know, is just what it is trying to make sense out of the similarity, is that Mark was probably written first. And that explains why um, not only do Matthew and Luke share some of the material that Mark has, but they tend, when, they're, when they are, when they are um, alike with Mark, they're also alike with each other. So it really does point to this possibility that they had a shared source in the Gospel of Mark. But then there's also these situations where Mark and Luke differ, or sorry, where Matthew and Luke differ from Mark, and there are points within that being different from Mark where they are once again very similar to each other. And so the general consensus is there probably was some written document that we have never found, uh, but probably something like a document that has many sayings of Jesus and that they probably had access to that source. And the name that we've just assigned to that source is Q, because it's the, uh, the first letter of the word Quella, which in German is source. The reason why I say all this is because it's almost like here are three teachings that Luke wanted to include, you know, that we would say from this Q source or whatever, uh, that he wanted to make sure we included these, these sayings of Jesus, but they don't seem to be connected to either what came before it or what comes after it. Um, but you have these th three bits that we see in, in Matthew, but in Matthew they're more fleshed out in their context. I say all that just to explain why it seems that these last three verses out of this five-verse passage are almost like a scattershot of, like, what are we talking about now? What does that have to do with anything? Excuse me, because we have no comment whatsoever about the Pharisees, you know, about divorce, and that's one of the biggest sections here. What I want to draw attention to, though, as far as the content of these particular verses, is that the, the Pharisees are hearing Jesus talk about money, and he's trying to talk about using money uh, for the kingdom of God. You know, using money to buy friendship, in a sense, you know, by, by, by being generous. Uh, and, then, and also this idea of being responsible in small things like riches. And um, this, the context of what Jesus says here is that that which is esteemed by human beings is detestable in the eyes of God. And the sense that we get here is that the Pharisees think of money as being very important, like probably unbelievably important. Um, money is kind of what makes their world go round. It is, it is uh, you know, very, very crucial for how the world works. 
And, uh, and the Pharisees, almost certainly, because so many people throughout history have felt this way, believed that, probably believed that, uh, that to have money was a sign of God's blessing. And what Jesus is doing here is he is saying that not only is money not necessarily a sign of God's blessing, uh, but that it is actually probably not a good thing for, for, the, for the people of God uh, to have huge quantities of money. They ought to be using it for the kingdom of God. And, uh, and that's the fascinating bit here, is that what's really countercultural, what Jesus is saying in these passages so far in this chapter, is that money, he's saying, is very, very useful, but it needs to be used to be useful. And it needs to be the kind of thing where you are, you are free to get rid of it because it has a purpose. But the purpose that it has can only ever be temporal in its immediate context. Yes, you can do some things with money that will ultimately have some eternal consequences, but the point seems to be money is only money. It is not life. It is not resurrection. It is not the power of God. It is this relatively small thing. And so it ought to be used but and treated as that relatively small thing. It's nothing compared to what God is up to in the world. And so if we lose all of, we had a choice between losing all of our money and keeping God or losing God and having all this money. Jesus is very clear. It's important that we serve God rather than money. And the Pharisees just can't handle it. And Jesus is reminding us the things of the kingdom of God are so much more important that God detests the things that tie us to this world in a way that distracts us from the things that really matter. And so um, I don't know what that means for you in your life, but it's a reminder that just because things are popular, just because lots of people like something, just because something seems honorable in this life does not mean that it's necessarily a good thing for Christians to be about. And I think it's always worth to keep that in the back of our minds so that uh, we are always prepared to be hearing God afresh uh, in every circumstance. Well, that's all I have for today. Come back in tomorrow. We'll finish up one more week uh, of Daily Bible Study. Have a good day.